Man, if I were to do it all over again, I would have just Long story short, don't do social media management. Probably worked with 1,200 med spas across the US. And we're doing, you know, a couple to a few hundred thousand a month in revenue and then eventually, you know, exited. That's a huge golden nugget. And also, that's how I scaled my first agency to like 15K a month. I was still in high school. One of our clients was spending like 20K a month with us. And that's more like corporate 500 level thinking, I feel like, in this space at least. I probably wouldn't sell without knowing what the next thing was. How much did you sell Patient Rhino for? We, we had multiple. Yo, 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 what is going on, guys? I am super excited because we got a legend in the house for this pod, guys. And uh, this is someone who um, has built and scaled. Uh, a seven-figure agency and has actually sold it, which is unheard of. Most people just completely shut down their agency um, and it goes out of business um, or they sell for an extremely low valuation. And Mr. Brett didn't do that. So Brett, thank you so much for hopping on. I'm super excited. would love the, for you to just share your story with the entire audience and tell people who you truly are. Because you're kind of one of those who's like, I feel like you're building your brand now, but you're kind of like, you work in the background, but you're having so much success. So I'm excited for people to finally get to meet you. Yeah, man. I'm definitely more of the the back end guy, kind of the ops, everything from there. Um, definitely enjoy, you know, some part being on the front end, but I'm also cool if I can just like have my headphones on working and just building things. Like I see me as like the integrator, the builder, just making sure that things run smoothly. And if people know I'm there, great. If they don't know I'm there, that's also cool. As long as I'm able to continue to grow, you know, work on what, what I actually, you know, get passionate on. And uh, yeah, man. So basically, long story short, I uh, got burnt out doing sales. I was in a call center for a few years um, or a couple of years, become a manager, managed a team of 16 at the call center, got burnt out, moved to Costa Rica. Uh, I was working at a hostel. And so I was just checking people in and I'd always be like, hey, where are you from? How long you been traveling? And I was just like shocked when people were like, yeah, I've been on the, you know, traveling six months, nine months, a year and a half now. And I'm like, how in the world do you do this? And the number one answer was I either work online or I have my own business. Mm -hmm. So that's what got my gears starting to like, OK, I want to be able to do this and to really just fuel my traveling. So I started Googling how to make money online. Long story short, got targeted by Dan Henry back in the day, bought his course, and then just been doing it ever since. So that's kind of you know what got me into the agency space was uh, was Dan Henry's course. So that, that's amazing. And you, how long were you in the agency space for? <sighs> Man, probably since 2015 or 16. Wow. And you just pretty much exited what, like last year? Yeah, last February. So over a year now. Yeah. I mean, that's crazy because you basically spent 2015, 2016, like uh, anywhere from, I barely graduated high school. So my math's a little off, but like around <laughs> about seven to eight years in the space. Yeah. You know, I, um, it's funny. I actually have this uh, tattoo now, burn your boats, which basically just means go all in essentially, you know, short mm. story. And, um, when I first started, man, I was actually working part-time, uh, at a basil, uh, a Thai restaurant okay. while I, I'd work in the day, just have everything. And then I was also doing everything from there, man. If I were to do it all over again, I would have just jumped in the deep end and just gone all in on it rather than, you know, devoting, uh, you know, a good amount of hours every day and week to, you know, serving food. Sure. I think I could have scaled way quicker and everything. If I just, like I said, just went all in on one thing rather than one foot in one foot out. Cause I was scared, you know, I'd never really done any of my own thing. My parents aren't entrepreneurs. Like they didn't have their own business. And so it was just like, I didn't have any friends that did it either. Right. So I was kind of hesitant one foot in one foot out having this plan B. Well, if it doesn't work and I can't do it, at least I have this restaurant. Right. Uh, man, if I were to do it again, dude, I would just say, you know, dive all in and just you're going to be able to figure it out if you're just sinking and then, you know, looking for that kind of life raft in order to kind of save you. Right. And then that's when you're going to figure out, like, how do I make money and how do I make the sales, everything from there? So, yeah, you know, the first year or two, man, it was just like a side hustle just for me at the time, just having everything. I wasn't going all in, you know, um, and uh, I, I wish that's something that I did. Um, but, you know, you live and learn. Yeah. And dude, tell tell me about patient rhino. Tell yeah, so about that. So at the time it was actually called Watts Social. My last name is Watts. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I was doing social media management and Facebook ads. Long story short, don't do social media management. You can't measure it. You can't track it. You can't charge much for it. And uh, I was, man, at the time when I started doing more of the Facebook ads, I had, you know, landscapers, residential cleaning companies, uh, the Thai restaurant I worked at, I actually ran their ads. You know, anybody that would basically pay me, I would have. Um, I ended up getting connected with um, a med spa, ran an event for them. Uh, We probably spent like 2000 bucks on ads. I think they made like 40K um, from the event. Um, which was like a four hour event. Sure. And, um, the rep that was there was like, Hey, who ran your ads? Long story short, I got introduced to them. And then this was where I first got power partners, which is something that I preach because that was a really easy way we were able to grow patient Rhino, which is a power partner is essentially somebody who has access to tens or hundreds of your ideal customers, pretty much at their fingertips. Yep. Right. These can be vendors. In this case, it was a sales rep. Most sales reps, like if you know want Botox, right, you can't but go on Amazon. You can't go to Walmart. You have to. The only way to get it is to get through a rep. Mm-hmm. A lot of these reps will typically have 30 to 80 locations each. Wow. So then she started saying, hey, I want you to also work with Dr. Johnson and I want you to work with this person. Oh, this other rep asked me, can I introduce you to them? And then it was like, oh, my gosh. OK. So then we get started getting so many referrals through these reps and power partners that I eventually shut down everything else. Um, at the, you know, grew that to like 25 clients, got in another mentorship program. Uh, our mentor at the time said, Hey, you and, you know, Nick, who was my partner said, you guys should partner. You're both doing med spas. You're both doing a similar offer. You're both at around the same revenue stage. So we actually did a merge and then, you know, that's kind of where we had, you know, patient right now. Um, and, uh, yeah, once we merged, he focused on the front end sales. I focused on everything back end, fulfillment, systems, automation, that kind of stuff. And then, man, we just really blew up from there. So the combo of power partners and actually merging with somebody and then dividing our skill sets uh, where we're not stepping on toes. I own this department. You own that department. And, you know, let's grow as fast as we can. And, uh, long story, you know, then from there, we probably worked with 1,200 med spas across the U.S. and we're doing, you know, a couple to a few hundred thousand a month in revenue and then it eventually, you know, exited. Dude, that's amazing. So um, that's super fascinating because you, the niche kind of found you to some extent. You didn't really. Yeah, I didn't. I did not look for it. I've never I've never even been in a med spa, much less mm. doing their marketing. So, so I, I, yeah, it, it sounds like a big part of your guys scaling was the fact that, you know, you had the power partners. I think that's a huge golden nugget. And honestly, that's how I scaled my first agency to like 15K a month. I was still in high school. It was just, I had a, I found a consultant in the gym space and he was just referring me as clients. You know, I didn't know anything about paid ads. I, I mean, I would cold call sometimes, but like, that's really how I scaled. So dude, I can't stress that enough. Like, especially in these really weird niches um, with the small TAMs or just interesting niches. So I am curious though, regarding your TAM, and that's for anyone listening that doesn't know, that's basically like the size of your market. How did you scale an agency in med spots? Cause there's only like what, a couple thousand in the United States. You know, it's, we can never get a complete number because you have an esthetician who rents a booth. Sure. Is she considered a med spa, right? Mm-hmm. You've got someone who does mobile. I'll go to your home and do Botox uh, on the side, right? Mm-hmm. Then you've got meds, you know, med spa, which is that you've got estheticians, you've got nurse practitioners. Then you've got, you know, plastic surgeons that also offer some of the same services. Then you've got a dentist who also offers. So the, it's really difficult to know the TAM, but you're right. It is small. Um, if I were to start again, well, I didn't think I'd ever get it that big to be transparent with you, you know? So I guess I probably would have done it, but if I were to start again, knowing what I had, I would absolutely look at something with the larger TAM, which is really, I'd say 30,000 locations or more in the U S which sounds like so many, but it's really not, you know, like you, you really need ample amount from there. And so, yeah, the TAM wasn't quite as big as what we would have liked it to be. So we did sometimes branch out just to go broader. So dentists sometimes have Botox, neurologists sometimes have Botox because you can do it for migraines. Mm. Um, They kind of treat different than fine lines and wrinkles. So that's a different story. But, you know, sometimes we would say, 
you know, these are the services we have, whether you're quote unquote a med spa or not, we can help you get more appointments. Super you know? fascinating. Yeah. Super fascinating. Okay. So let's go ahead and kind of break that down, right? Because you still had a tremendous amount of success with the agency. And it sounds like having a partner was one of them. Having a power partner was also valuable to you, but sometimes broadening your services. But for the people out there listening and they're in these small niches, the, the small TAMs, what would be your feedback to them to still have the success that you guys had? Um, yeah, the power partners would definitely be a big one. Um, I mean, I could preach on that all day long, but we all know that referrals close at a higher rate. They already come with you with a, a sense of trust and credibility already. Typically, referrals are not going to go do more research and say, well, let me talk to this other company. They're just going to say, hey, I trust this person. They said to work with you. What's the cost? Cool. Uh, obviously, it's sometimes you got to fight a little bit, but, you know, that would be a big one from there. Um, you know, I would say. For us, I'm looking for a repeatable process. I'm looking for almost templatized with still a little bit of customization where I can essentially have either an, a, a virtual assistant or somebody on the team that can rinse and repeat and take this thing and just do it over and over and over again. When I was at first doing chiros and med spas and dentists and landscapers, everything was a custom build. And who did that rely on? I couldn't have my virtual assistant do it. It fell back on me. I had to create the ads, create the copy, the headlines, the landing pages, the go high level workflows, uh, the text automations, the email automate. You know, it, it's so much that need to be done from everything. And so from there, we basically say, even in the med spa industry, the frustrating thing with that industry is there's always a shiny object. There's always a new laser, a new body contouring, a new injectable, a new, you know, whatever it may be. And so it got to the point that we said, hey, these are the five treatments we're doing. I don't care if they want more. I don't care if they say that, hey, well, if you can't do this, we're going to go to someone else because everything pulled me in. And so it's to build a, a systematized process. I'd, I've always been a believer. I'd, I'd rather be very good at a couple things rather than mediocre at everything that gets thrown my way. Mm. So out of those five treatments we had, you know, which were like injectables and filler and laser hair removal and body contouring and stuff like that, like those were the groups. If it didn't fall in the group, I'm sorry, like we're, we're, we're not the best fit for you. Mm -hmm. The only exception we would make if we had like an office that had four locations and they were spending like one of our clients were spending like 20K a month with us. Like we would make exceptions for them, right? You have power when you're spending so much with somebody, right? But besides that, if it's your average one, we would, we would turn. So I think the power of saying no is something that like really allowed us to get very good at a couple things and just... Like we were, I think, dominant for a, a while in, in those services because, you know, we were very good at it. That's super interesting. There are a lot of agencies. They don't have any client concentration, which for sometimes it's, it's valuable, especially when it comes to the exit of it, you know, if it's, you know, um, not too big of a concentration with certain clients. But it sounds like you guys probably had clients that had, you know, 10, 15, 20 locations, what you like you just said. So how do you find clients like that? How do more agencies do stuff like that? Because essentially that's a super valuable contract. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, you know, ideally you can, you, you want to look for some, there, there are certain sites you can see franchises. Franchises can be hit or miss. Um, I love getting into them. Sometimes they're harder to break into. Sure. Um, but if you can get in with the franchise and then you can do really good for one, you have the plug to then say, introduce to the others, well, eventually you go up the value ladder and then if you can get in those. Now, I didn't, we worked with some franchises um, that had multiple locations, but we weren't like their go-to person for the franchises. However, we were for devices. Mm -hmm. So we went a different route, right? So think, um, you know, I'm not gonna say our machine just for the sake of it, but like say uh, cool sculpting, right? It's a, it's a non-invasive fat reduction treatment, right? When you get cool sculpting, um, you have to go through like training so you don't like hurt somebody, right? It's like a medical device. If you do it wrong, you could, like someone could get injured, right? Um, so anytime you buy a device like that, we would then partner with these device companies to say, hey, now that you have this, if you want customers, you should work with Patient Rhino. Mm, that's so. So again, that's an, that's another power partner that you have that's going straight down from the source. 
Why even go online and look for another company when the person you bought it from is saying, this is who we trust? Dude, that is genius. And I wish so many agencies thought like that. And that's more like corporate 500 level thinking, I feel like in this space, at least. Yeah. Uh, no one's thinking big enough. So that's super valuable. And I think if people don't get anything from this podcast, they better get that because that can absolutely blow up the business as I'm sure it did for you guys. So that relationship took us like six months to land. Wow. These like more corporate level, like national, sometimes global companies, like, mm -hmm. you know, you're kind of working your way up the value ladder and the hierarchy of like command. Mm -hmm. Right. And so um, Nick and I, for a while, my partner, we blocked an hour a week on our calendar called Power Partners, where for months, all we would do was devote that hour once a week to just building relationships, sales reps, vendors, um, trainers, coaches, Facebook groups, devices. I mean, the amount of Power Partners are endless, right? And so it was devoted to once a week for months to just focus on building those relationships. Cause for you to meet somebody, like they're not just gonna send you their customers. Like you've gotta have that trust. And so part of this was texting them, hey, just wanna let you know, this is Dr. Sally. You know, in her first week alone, she's already gotten 18 booked appointments. Mm -hmm. Anyways, hope you're doing well. Just wanna let you know the person you referred, like they're absolutely loving it. Mm -hmm. It's just like building that trust, right? It's just staying top of mind. Dude, that's so cool. That's so cool. I'm that's yeah. that's amazing. I'm um dude, I, I'd like to dive into that because I'm assuming that helped the enterprise value out a lot with the agency and it made the agency a lot more appealing to a buyer. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about the sale of patient rhino. First off, like what made you guys decide to wanna to leave, to exit? You know, I think we've just been in it for so long that it was one of those things that like for me it was running very smoothly. You know, I mean, I would work more because I enjoy just the act of working and building, sure. right? But if I could do 10 hours a week, the company could not only sustain, but it could also continue to grow. Mm -hmm. Like we got to the point where we had anywhere from 12 to 16 people on the team. 12, 10 to 12 is like our sweet spot. Um, I kind of was more, you know, every our, at the time of the sale, the newest hire we had in our company was a year and a half. Mm. The newest hire, right? Wow. So <laughs> it's not only having an org chart that can run the day to day, but also tenure is very important sure. um, as well, because, you know, if, if a lot of the guys on our team were three months, it's like, well, I don't know if they're going to stick around. It's hard to argue the fact that the newest employee was a year and a half. Yeah. You know, I had some that were, you know, four plus years. Um, and so I think for us, it's not only how do you build a good product to make sure that your, your clients stick around, but how do you build a good culture where your team actually wants to stick around? Because that's equally as important. So people always talk about retention with clients, but what about retention with your team? Mm. Now, obviously, sometimes you need to be cut. Now, the, the only exception were sometimes sales reps, because that's typically a higher cool. turn. But everybody that had to do with fulfilling the actual product itself was a yeah. year and a half, whether it's CSMs, media buyers, VAs, whatever it may be from there. And so at the end of the day, you've got to build something that, Every buyer is going to do a risk assessment. Mm -hmm. Now, we spoke with dozens of buyers, and they all have their own framework when they come on the call. Some, one thing is important to the other guy. An, another buyer, something else may be more important to him. But they all, we noticed that this pattern, that they all come prepared with these set of questions. And what it comes down to is they're, they're all doing a risk assessment. It's how risky is this business to buy? Whether I'm doing my own capital or if I'm going to do a small business loan, is this something stable that if I come into this, because most buyers we come from, number one, most did not come from marketing. And number two, nobody pretty much came from med spas, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so it, it's scary yeah. buying. I mean, you know, like you bought a car wash, like how much did you know about car washes, right? Like you've got to have some kind of level of trust that, okay, I actually don't know this industry inside and out. Like I need to make sure that the systems, the protocol, the processes, the people are in place where if something does go, who, what can I rely on? Yeah. And so it really came down to what can we do to mitigate and remove any level of stress and fear when they do a risk assessment that can they feel trust in this? And that's one reason why I feel like we were able to, to exit is because 
we had very good processes. Everything was very well documented. We had SOPs in every department, how to hire new employees, how to onboard new people, how to register A2P with high level, how to, I mean, it was a giant library that you could search either a tag or a, you know, a word and everything pulls up here. So it's like, well, what if your tenure who is running your day-to-day, your operator, what if she does leave? Okay. Who cares? Everything is documented. <laughs> Dude, that's like, yeah, she she may. You know? So yeah, it's it's having a tenure team and then having SOPs in place where even if they do leave, worst case scenario, because for us, we sold uh, the team members with it. Yep. Uh, it, it, it came included. That's usually what you're gonna do mm-hmm. um with like some type of asset based sale. Yep. Um, not always, but you know, that 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 was important for us. I couldn't have got here without the team, and so I told my broker. I don't care if someone's going to come in and want to buy us for more. If they don't want the team, we're, we're not interested. Like I couldn't have do, done it without the team. And so I just didn't feel right with my like heart to like, Hey, thanks for getting me here. I'm going to go take all this money and uh, good luck. Go, go, go find another job. Like you're cut. Like I just, that just didn't sit right with me, you know? Yeah. Makes sense, man. Um, All right. I, I want to dive deeper into that, right? Like what, when people are thinking about, because I, for a long time, I don't think selling an agency, at least in the in the world, I mean, I feel like we came up in, um, it it was just like build an automated agency. Exiting yeah. was never on my horizon until you know a recent uh, you know thing happened. So for you guys, um, what would you say for the people listening right now that you know never really thought about selling their agency? Uh, but they may be open to it in the future. What should their expectation be? And what should they start doing now to get ready for a potential exit in the future? So that's a great question. And I'll be honest with you, we were not looking to sell either. I had no intention to actually exit. Mm -hmm. Uh, I never even thought about that. Like it didn't even cross my mind. Because, you know, like you said at the beginning, like I don't really know a lot of agencies that have successfully exited. You know, yeah, I know a couple people now because like my brokers introduced me to a few people and that kind of stuff. But like there's there's only a handful. Um, And so, you know, I think from here, you've got to come in. The reason we were able to is just because I focused on the operations. To it just naturally became a sellable asset, but that actually wasn't my intention. Um, I think coming into it, you should always build your company to be sellable. 100%. Because naturally building your company to sell will naturally cause you to scale way faster, way easier without the bottlenecks and the friction and everything else. So, you know, luckily, because I was focused on the ops and the systems, it was more for me to how do I build this to be a lifestyle business where if I want to go snowboarding in the Swiss Alps or go to South America, I can and still not have the fear that I'm going to have nonstop buyers. Yep. So that was really my intention was how do I build it where it can kind of be a lifestyle business where I can still have great cash flow. But also if I want to go do a trip, I don't have the fear of just things breaking and red alerts and, you know, nonstop fire one after the other. Because of that, it just became a more sellable asset. But that wasn't actually my intention. Um, There's things that I noticed that every buyer that I know, because I think if you go into it with let me build it to be sellable. Not only are you going to help increase the valuation, if the time comes, maybe it doesn't. And if it doesn't, you're going to be smoother anyway. Um, but if you do get to the point to say, hey, I am ready to sell, it's it's too late. People want data. It doesn't matter if in 30 days you were able to show that this is your highest month ever. They're going to look at that and say, maybe you had a, a, a lucky time. Um, I, I'm not even, I don't even care about last month that that was a record breaking month. Now, the, the fact that you're going up, yeah, that's good. Right. But like they want historical data. And so one of the things that we could have gotten better at, you know, the last year and a half before we sold, we started getting really pretty good data. Yeah. Like lifetime value and churn and what was our, you know, just overall retention from everything. But I noticed at the time of the sale, we could have gone way deeper. Mm. Like what people really wanted to know was, okay, so you have a done for you product. You've got a do it yourself product. You've got a course. You've got high level white label. You've got a done with you offer, you know, so we had different products that we could sell. Um, they wanted to know, well, what's the lifetime value of the done for you? Yep. Well, what's, what's the churn for the do it yourself, yep. you know? And so some of that we have, but some of it we didn't. 
And by then it's just like, man, like, yeah, I could try to go export it in Stripe, but sometimes people use different emails and different uh, names and different, and sometimes the, the customer, you could have, you know, one location, but they're in Stripe, sometimes they're like five customers because sure. their business partner now wanted to pay this month. You know what I mean? It just gets messy. And it's just like, man, like we can't go back. And, and it was just like, man, I, it would spend hours and weeks, I mean, months to get some of that data. And so, you know, a lesson from there is like, man, if I, I would have just had this, because not only would it be more valuable for me, because what if we we're focused our time trying to sell something that the lifetime value of is just, you know, kind of crap. And now if it's easy to fulfill like um, high level affiliates, right, sure. What whatever, right, takes no effort. But if it's something that like your team has to build and you've got to be on one-on-one -on -one calls and, on, you know what I mean, like the amount of time that goes into fulfillment based on the value you're getting in return based on the, the monetary amount, sometimes it's not worth it. And so you're able to make the educated decisions based on actual data, not emotion. You know, and so the biggest thing I would say is from day one, you know, really focus on tracking. And if you need to go on Fiverr and pay somebody to build out a, it could be a Google spreadsheet. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. It's just how do you get the data in front of you at your fingertips where you can make an educated decision? Mm -hmm. Like that's what's important. Mm -hmm. Dude, hundred percent, man. And we we dealt with that same challenge when we were in due diligence, and our data room was an absolute mess because yeah, like we had certain things but like you said we missed out on on a lot of other stuff so dude i couldn't i couldn't stress that enough i tell that to my private clients all the time we make decisions only based off data we need the data it's so yeah it's, because a sellable business is a good business and it, you will make way better decisions when you know all the different data points that are driving your business forward or taking it backwards so mm -hmm. i think that's a huge goal tonight i wrote down a question that i do want to ask you about which is for me, I struggled, you know, after exiting the agency and I, I didn't know what the next steps were for me. Um, how did you figure out? I think that's a, what a lot of people get in their mentality. I talk to a lot of my students that are able to sell now. They're like, I just don't know what I would do. <laughs> so yeah. how, did you, how did you get the clarity on figuring out how you're going to get out of an industry that you were in for like 70 plus years and go yeah. into something totally different? Yeah, man. I mean, I, I, I'll be honest about it, which maybe... You know, I, I think it's good to just kind of be open from it. Um, if I were to do it again, I probably wouldn't sell without knowing what the next thing was, just to be honest. Um, I, I personally struggled a little bit with what's called like I didn't. And I try to figure out, like, wh what is this I'm going through, to, you know, after researching and doing some stuff, you know, a, a term called identity crisis. It's extremely popular for like athletes or business owners and entrepreneurs. Think about an athlete who's, you know, you've been in the NFL for 12 years and you get an injury that you can no longer play again. Okay. Like, dude, their whole life, high school, college, post-college, like it's all been like your identity is an NFL player, right? It's kind of the same for me. It's like my identity was I'm an agency owner. I am patient rhino. I am, you know, in this community, like that, that was my identity. So when that got stripped away, um, man, it was, it, 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 there were some times where it was pretty tough of like, what am I going to do now? You know, um, mm -hmm. you know, and so now, you know, I, I, it was also the time in my life. I've got a six month old daughter now. So I sold my business. Uh, my wife was already pregnant when I sold. I also moved across country from Colorado to North Carolina. So I bought a new house, moved in a new neighborhood. I've never even, I bought my house on, sight unseen. Uh, you know, I sold the business, moved across the country and then I'm having a kid. So it's like all oh. these major life changes like happening within a couple months together. Yeah. So it wasn't at the time where like, I wasn't looking to start a new business from ground zero again, because I wanted to be able to support at home with, you know, having a kid. And so I just kind of worked on consulting and now, you know, helping build more sellable assets and agencies where you can, whether you want to sell or not build it that way so you can operationally not be pulled in every direction. Um, and basically just where the business depends on you. Like I said, I was able to take spontaneous trips. So it's like either way you want to look at it, let's just build and focus on the operation. So I just went into that. There's uh, a couple of businesses that I'm looking to, to start as well. I'm exploring, which, you know, we can go on to maybe after the call, but uh, um, yeah, you know, it's, but at this end of the day, I had a skill set. 
I knew that I was good. I had a, I was relatively well known just through mentorships and programs that I was in. So it wasn't hard to find something. So I wanted something that I could work my own hours. I could, you know, leverage my skill set to help other people grow. I mean, it's the same thing that you're doing, right? You've built multiple agencies. So you know how to do it. Uh, I don't necessarily want to have my own again. Um, yeah, but man. I do enjoy, <laughs> you know, but I but I do enjoy, you know, building um, and growing sales teams and marketing and operations and that kind of stuff, right? So, so I enjoy the agency space. I just don't necessarily want to be in it. So I knew that, right? Yeah. Um, I also did cold email to other businesses um, that were in the home service industry, basically mm-hmm. saying, hey, I had an advertising agency. No, I'm not reaching out to you to be an agency. I'm looking for a partner. If you need help with generating leads, operations, hiring, resources, maybe becoming sellable, like, I'd love to see if it just makes sense. And then I, I always have like a line in my cold email where it's like, man, it, it never hurts to have a conversation, yep. you know? And, um, and you know, I, and then I started talking with other industries because, man, the agency space, like, although I don't necessarily want to start it again, dude, the skill sets you learn from it are essential in any business. So Every bad. business needs leads, Yep. you know? So if you can do that, it doesn't matter what industry, if you want to go in home service or medical or recruiting or Amazon, like whatever, right? The skills. So that's why I love the fact that I started in this space because you can take this skill set and apply it in any industry. You know, you learn Zapier, you learn sales, you learn CRMs, you learn just generating leads and how to convert those leads, right? So I think this is an amazing space that anybody should get into if they know they want to do business, whether it's for a year, whether it's for seven years, and then kind of just see naturally what comes, what, what happens. But I think as long as you're putting yourself out there, you're having conversations, you're having phone calls, maybe go on a networking events, right? You're going to find a business that needs marketing. Yeah. Like it's not going to be that hard to partner with somebody else, you know? And so that's kind of what I did. And so now I'm just kind of helping others with their marketing and sales and, you know, all that so yeah dude i couldn't i couldn't agree more and you know for a while i got into sma because it was for the money and i looking back at it i didn't know why i was still doing it but looking back at it man i was really working to, to learn not work to earn because this first yeah. few years like looking back i didn't make any money like sure nah, i did no nah. i knew but like it wasn't profit nah, uh, yeah. until like maybe like the last two three <laughs> years of being in it that's when i really started making like decent money uh, so I think everyone needs to remember that you're in this space to get the skill sets, because like you said, you could go out there and do anything. SMMA is a three out of 10 opportunity that requires 10 out of 10 effort. And yeah. you go out there and find a 10 out of 10 uh, opportunity and put 10 out of 10 effort. And the reason why so many agency owners aren't where they could be in terms of what their skill set is and the value that they actually provide is, in my opinion, they're just in the wrong vehicle. There's mm. way, they were way smarter than a lot of, like I'm, I'm doing M&A now, similar to you. And I see so many small business owners that are making so much money, but quite frankly, they're just really good at carpentry. They're really good at putting roofs on houses. They're not yeah. best, the best business owners. And that's, there's nothing wrong with that, but you could take someone who's in SMMA, plug them into that business and absolutely blow it the frick up. Oh, oh crush it. A better vehicle. So I think yeah. that's super valuable, man. That's I completely agree with what you just said. Yeah. Um, dude, I want to ask you just a few more quick questions. Yeah, like, let's do it. This is the question that everyone's gonna want to know. Um, how did how much did you sell Patient Rhino for? <laughs> you don't have to tell me if you can't, but um, but... yeah, I can't say the exact number, but you know, it was we we had multiple seven figures kind of going from it, so um. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, the, the, the thing, we had some things that, that were hurting us. Mm. Um, we did turn off our sales team um, for seven months. Wow. Um, because we were, you know, looking at different business opportunities. I, I'll be honest, we were just going to dissolve patient right now. Mm-hmm. Like it got to the point that we were both very removed. We were just going to let it ride. And we figured out with our churn and we had multiple CSMs. And, you know, if we turned off all marketing, all sales, now, we, if we got a referral, if a CSM could do an upsell, sure, we'd take it on. But we were just going to do that, right? So we had multiple things going against us. You, t- you want to talk to a buyer and say, we haven't had a sales and marketing team for seven months. That's going to cause some red flags, yeah. right? 
Um, but the fact that we had great retention, we had a good product, we had a systematized machine that both owners were pretty much removed from, <laughs> yep. right? It's like, I still, th I st so part of it's like, man, I wish we just held on a little bit longer because we could have gotten, you know, way, way more. But the fact that we were still able to have a seven figure exit with no sales and marketing for seven months, just because we had good documentation, the team was tenured, like it was still a great risk, you know, for, for, for buyers. Right. And so, um, also the data, like we could have had like, yeah, some stuff we had very good, but other stuff that they wanted, it's like, man, we didn't really have that. So I wish I went a little bit more into there, but I think if you just build, you know, focus on something that can be duplicatable, you can remove yourself. You as the owner basically need to not be responsible for getting clients, fulfilling on clients or like any management of clients, you know, um, if you can remove yourself from those, then that's a, that's a way more sellable asset. Yeah. Dude, that's awesome. That's awesome to hear. Um, and that is super, super cool that you guys were able to sell. I think that's a real testament to to your product and LTV. We're going to have to bring you on for another podcast to talk about how to build a freaking good product because you didn't have a sales team for seven months. You had no new inbound stuff, but because your retention was so good, your LTV was so powerful, you still had a seven-figure exit. That blows my freaking mind. Um, Brett, I am lastly curious about how does an agency get valued? Um essentially what are what are the typical multiples that yeah so it's basically based on profit at the end yeah. of the day um you, most people know the term ebitda mm -hmm. right but unless you know if, if you're less than five to ten million a month you're, you're never actually going to be ebitda you're actually going to be sde mm -hmm. which is seller discretionary earnings yeah. um which is actually cool because you can basically <laughs> yeah it's better um you can put back a lot more expenses into your profit that were not essential for the business to run. So I'll give you some examples. We had a personal assistant, Nick and I shared. Um, she would wash my car every week. She would uh, run errands. She'd pick up some groceries. She would just do like do flights for us. Now, yes, yeah, she did a little bit for the business. She'd like manage my email, you know, help us uh, some Stripe billing stuff. But mm -hmm. like, was she essential? No. You know, I paid $50,000 for a mastermind. Yep. Was that essential for the business to operate? No. Uh, we flew the team out to Miami, did a team retreat. Was that essential for the team to operate? No. So all these things you can actually add back, which actually adds more back into your profit. Yep. 100%. Um, and so it basically goes off of your, your add backs and your profit. Uh, and then multipliers, you're typically going to have like the average is going to be like two to four. Can you have much higher? Yes. But if you're at the 2 million, 3 million, 4 million, like you're, you're probably not going to get a ton more higher than that. Um, uh, unless you just are fully removed and, um, you know, the business continues to not only sustain, but also to grow without you. And you're not responsible. For, you're not the face on the ads to, to get the sales calls. You're not the one taking the sales calls and you're not the one fulfilling the product, whether it's SEO or Facebook ads or, you know, whatever else it may be from there. Mm -hmm. So basically it goes off that, you know, you're going to have a two to four X multiplier again, mm -hmm. based on their risk assessment. How involved are you? What's the tenure? What's the lifetime value? You know, everything from there, but yet yeah, easy number, Profit for the year, two to four X that, generally speaking. Yeah. And, and typically buyers, I mean, from my experience, buyers are also looking at not just, you know, one year, not your best year. They're looking at an average of the last three yeah. years. So people need to, you know, when people are thinking about selling, this is for everyone out there listening, right? Like you can't run the business for a year and a half and expect to get a seven figure exit. Like it's nah. I'm sure it might be possible, but you're not getting much up front. It's going to be all seller financing. And at that point, that's not guaranteed. Um, yeah. So you need at least three years of at least tax returns. And those three years should be pretty good years in profit if you want a good valuation. So I think that's another yeah. just tidbit for people. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, that, that, that's pretty much it. Yeah, just ha have good bookkeeping. Document everything, have a loom and written, make yep. it easy to find. 
uh, treat your team well, you know, uh, not just compensation wise, but like, man, people want to grow like themselves. Yeah. Like it's not just all about, you know, like it's the fact of, uh, you know, if we had employees that were sick, sometimes I'd uh, get Panera bread delivered and send yeah. some hot soup their way. Mm -hmm. That costs like $12. Yeah. <laughs> and mm -hmm. then they're like, Oh my God, that was just so nice. It's like, you know, like one of our guys, he was a CSM. He was one of our top performers and he never took time off. And um, I would tell him. And uh, finally, he went to uh, Destin, Florida. And he was taking his family. And I said, like, what are y'all doing? He's oh, we're just going to hang out on the beach. So I start Googling activities in Destin, Florida. Yeah. Did I end up getting him a double-decker pontoon boat that I paid for for the day? Wow. I mean, yeah, it was like, it was a few hundred dollars. But dude, he was our best performer. He was with me for like two years. You know, yeah. he never took time off. So for me to like, dude, he was like sending videos of like his family and his kids going on the slide. And like. Dude, it doesn't matter if I had another company poach him. Dude, he's not leaving me. Yeah, hundred percent. Like Dude, those I small things, it can be car. It could be a bowl of hot soup. Like just the gestures are the things that, like, I think was the thing that we really were able to do to like really keep our employees like happy. Hmm. Brett, yeah. you just proved something to me. You know, I talk to a lot of successful agency owners. I've seen a lot of unsuccessful ones, and I I think the difference is the long term mindset. It's a marathon. It is not a sprint. And by remembering that and realizing that you can keep things so simple because simple scales and everything yeah. you just mentioned, it's, it, to me, it's, it's, it's simple. It's just the simple, just do the basic stuff and care, actually care about, yeah. care about your clients and, and, you know, do everything to its fullest. Don't half, half ass anything. Right. And I think that's what it comes down to. Um, so I loved it. I loved everything that we talked about today. Um, the last question I have for you is if, and I ask this to everyone, if you're at the top of the mountain and there's people on the ground and you have to find a way up the mountain, what would, or you have to recommend a way for them to get up the mountain. Mountain can symbolize life or so many other things. There's a storm coming. If they don't get up the mountain. They're going to get flooded out. They're going to die. What would be your piece of advice to get them up the mountain? Um, I would try to find leverage. Mm. Leverage could be a pulley where if I'm pulling this way, it pulls all the heavy stuff up with it. It could be a skill set that I have. It could be Zapier. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it, it could be how do I apply leverage in order to produce that would allow the least resistance on my end for the maximum output? Mm. And maybe that's, maybe that's, okay, what resources do I have in order to get leverage? Maybe it's the fact that, okay, cool. I see a mile that way if I walk that way. Yeah, it's the opposite way of the mountain, but at the base, I see a helicopter. Hmm. Would you rather walk a mile this way knowing that you can just chill the rest of the way yeah. or climb the mountain and, and fall and slip down and then you got to go back up and you got ice, you know what I mean? So yeah, it'd, it'd be... It'd be what skill sets do I have? What resources? Maybe it's capital. Maybe it's skill. Maybe it's knowledge. Maybe it's connections and your network. Mm -hmm. And then how do I leverage that in order to help get me there even faster or easier? Mm -hmm. So leverage all, all day long in one way or the other. Heck yeah. That's amazing. Brett, thank you so much for coming on. Guys, if you enjoyed that, uh, make sure you connect with Brett on all his socials. They're going to be down below. Make sure you comment down below, like this video, subscribe for more fire content like this one. Brett, thank you so much for hopping on, man. Love you, bro. Appreciate you having me, man. Yo, yo, yo. I hope you guys enjoyed that video. If you liked it, make sure you smash that like button, hit the subscribe button, and turn on bell notifications so I can see you in the next one. And last but not least, make sure you guys check out one of these fire videos that the YouTube algorithm just hand selected for you. And guys, if you want to work with me on a one on one basis so I can help you scale your agency and take it to new heights like I've done in the past because I've built two seven figure marketing agencies before I could legally drink, go ahead, click down below, fill out an application, and I'll see you guys soon. Peace.